I've had some good days. I've had some hills to climb. I've had some weary days. And some lonely nights. But when I look around and I think things over, all of my good days, they simply outweigh my bad days. So I, I won't complain. Sometimes my clouds hang low. I can hardly see the road. I ask the question, Lord, why, why so much pain? Well, he knows what's best for me. Even though my weary eyes, they cannot see. So I say, Thank you, Lord. I, I won't complain. Because God has been good to me. He's been so good to me. More than this world could ever be. He's dried all of my tears away. Then he turned all of my midnights into day. So I just want to say thank you, Lord, for all of the good days. Thank you, Lord, even for the bad days. Thank you, Lord. I, I won't complain. Heavenly Father, again, we thank you for this time that we can spend together in your word. We ask that you would... Uh, open our hearts to receive what you have to say to us, that we would not just be hearers of the word, but doers. And we'll thank you for that in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, if you know anything about me, you know that I am not much of a green thumb, um, I, that I don't have, uh, you know, I'm not a horticultural expert. And, uh, and so um, uh, when it comes to growing plants and things like that, I leave that to Carol uh, because if it was left up to me, it would all just, you know, shrivel away. Um, but, but here in this text, as we, as we uh, read this text, I want you to understand that just as there are certain steps and things that you need to do in order to see a plant grow in your garden, there are also certain steps that we need to follow uh, in this example of Philip uh, if we're going to see the spread of the gospel seed in our lives and in the lives of others. And so um, follow with me as uh, we see, understand that the gospel takes root uh, in man and in our culture as we follow certain steps. The first thing I want you to see is in verse 26 that the gospel seed is sown. Uh, that notice here that it says in verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip. 
Now, let me stop just for a second and, and notice that it's not the angel of the Lord. Uh, there's no definite article there. It is an angel of the Lord, uh, especially in the Old Testament. When you read through and you see the angel of the Lord, uh, that usually when you see uh, the, the article there in the Hebrew in the Old Testament, it is talking about a divine appearance of God, a theophany is what the theologians call it. It's, it's Jesus before his time, the Son of God revealing himself to man in the Old Testament. And that happens over and over. I don't have the time to tell you all the times, but you can do it in your own Bible study and see when the angel of the Lord appeared and, uh, and, and as a divine appearance. Here in this text, uh, that's not the formula that we see. This is an angel, just another messenger from God. And uh, this angel went up and approached Philip and directed him to go to an Ethiopian who was on the road from Jerusalem. Uh, and so he gave him some specific instructions. I need to, to, to let you know that sowing the seed of the gospel starts by being sensitive to the prompting of the Lord. When, when the Lord lays something on your heart, sowing the seed means that you are going to begin by being obedient to and sensitive to what the Lord is saying to you. I love in the, in the next verse, in verse 27, when, when the text says, so he arose and went. In other words, the angel gave him the message. He was prompted to go uh, and follow these directions. So he arose and went. He decided that he was going to obey these directions. How many times have you felt prompted to speak to somebody, to witness to somebody, and you just let the time go by? Uh, oh, you all, you all don't, you know. But let's be honest with ourselves. We're not always sensitive to the prompting of the Spirit of God. Sometimes, even when we're sensitive to it and we realize that's what God is saying to us, that, you know what, you need to talk to that person in the cubicle next to you. He's going through a rough time right now. Uh, maybe you need to hand a, a track or a yellow card to that person in line at the supermarket or the bank. And the Spirit of God lays something on your heart, but, but here we are, we're frozen in our shoes and we let the moment pass. I want to suggest to you that the gospel seed has to be sown uh, it has to be delivered if we're going to see any results. You can't expect to see a plant grow if you don't put the seed in the ground. Are you hearing what I'm saying? And there are too many times that, that we just pray for people, and that's a good thing. We need to pray for people. But in addition to praying for people, we need to drop that seed in the ground. The gospel has to be planted and sown. And it's a matter of eternal life when we miss opportunities to sow the gospel seed. There, there are several reasons for our lack of witnessing. Sometimes it's unbelief on our part. Sometimes it's fear that keeps us stuck in our cement shoes where we are. Sometimes it's just a lack of confidence that we have that we can actually sow the seed properly. But we need to remember that success is not seeing a conversion. Success is not seeing somebody go through the prayer. Success is when you sow the seed and leave the results to God. Uh, you need to realize that 90% of church members have never experienced leading somebody to Christ. 90%. The, when I was reading those stats, I was saying, that's crazy. I hope that's not the percentage here at Marco Bible Fellowship, but I'm afraid it's still a pretty high percentage that have never had the joy of sitting next to somebody and sharing the gospel. 
walking them through. I don't care if it's the Roman road, the four A's, ABC, whatever it is, sharing the story of Jesus and his love. There are so many believers that have never had that privilege. And every one of us as believers, we have the responsibility to be sowers. Uh, we may never see the results of, of seeing somebody come and accepting Christ, but, uh, but we have the responsibility to be a sower. And how can they call on him in whom they have not believed? And how can they believe in whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without a preacher? So we are called to be sowers. I have a question for you today. Do you have pretty feet? Nobody's raising their hand. Well, the prophet Isaiah says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace. And so uh, we need to begin to sow the gospel seed all over Montgomery County. We need to sow the gospel seed all over Lansdale. We need to sow the gospel seed all over the world as best we can as a, as a church here in Lansdale, Pennsylvania. And so uh, he, he, the seed was sown in his heart. Um, now, you know, notice that the gospel seed also needed to be watered. Uh, it needed to be watered. Philip followed the call of the Holy Spirit. In verse 30, it says, he ran up to the Ethiopian. Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, do you understand what you are reading? Now, you know, as he approached um, Philip, he, he noticed that he was reading Isaiah 53. That was a passage there that, that the Ethiopian was reading. And you have to remember that this Ethiopian, and I mentioned it a couple of weeks ago, this Ethiopian had gone to Jerusalem for the Feast of the Pentecost. He was there, no doubt, he was right there in the congregation when Peter was preaching. He would have heard that whole message that Peter delivered. In Jerusalem on that day, through the preaching of Peter, we find that the gospel seed was sown. But he still had questions. He still had issues. He still was uncertain about all that he had heard. So he's on his way back out of Jerusalem now in his chariot, and he had these questions floating around in his mind, and he's reading Isaiah 53, trying to figure out who this Jesus really was. And so no doubt um, the gospel seed had been sown in his heart, but it was still dry and it needed to be watered. Now, you know, that reminds us that, that it's not good enough just to sow the seed, but that seed needs to be watered. And sometimes the person who sows the seed may not be the same person who waters the seed. And so, you know, it, you never fail when you sow a seed. Even if you never see the result, even if you never, you know, see that that person come to Christ or make a decision, Peter, if that man was the only one standing there and outside of the 3,000 that were, that were receiving Christ that day, if that man was the only one, Peter would have seen him walk away and felt as though his message was a failure. But, but even though Peter never saw that Ethiopian come and get baptized there in Jerusalem, he sowed the seed, and it was later that the Lord sent Philip to go and water that seed. And so we need to make sure that we understand that the seed needs to be watered. And so Philip asked him in verse 30, do you understand what you're reading? And, and I like his response in the next verse, in verse 31, the Ethiopian says, how can I unless somebody guides me? How can I understand? You see, this Ethiopian represents so many of us that are struggling to understand what the Bible is teaching. And in addition to sowing, we need to be involved with watering those seeds that have been sown 
because I need you to know that there are a lot of people who still have questions. There are a lot of people on your job and in your community, in your family maybe, that have heard the gospel, but they still have doubts and they still have questions and they still have uncertainty in their mind. And watering is simply helping those who have heard the truth, not only to believe the truth, but to also shape their lives to conform to the truth. And so watering is basically discipleship. When we talk about watering, we're describing discipleship. It's the process of teaching and demonstrating the gospel to affect the growth of the life of Jesus and the life of those that we disciple. Discipleship is the discipline of understanding who you are in Christ, being who God wants you to be, and doing what God wants you to do. That's what discipleship is. It's helping somebody to take the gospel that has been planted and to see it grow in their lives to the point where they are walking and doing and being who God wants them to be. So discipleship is not just uh, the watering that brings somebody to the point of decision and in, in accepting Christ. Discipleship continues on in the Christian walk and Christian experience until that person becomes all that God wants them to be. You know what that means to me? Every last one of us still needs discipleship. And if there's something that I believe uh, needs to be said in the church of Jesus Christ is that too many Christians reach a point where, you know, uh, I'm a pretty good Christian. I read the Bible through and I, I understand the basic doctrines and I go to church every week. So I don't need discipleship. I don't need to, to be there. I don't need any more Bible study. I think I've got enough right here. I don't need any accountability. I don't need anybody in my face telling me when I'm right and when I'm wrong. I can do pretty good on my own. Oh, I'm not talking to you all. I'm talking about ABC Church down the street. Come on now. I think there are too many of us right here at Monco Bible Fellowship that are satisfied and complacent about where our Christian experience is. We need discipleship. We need some water. We need to continue to see that plant grow in our lives. And God is calling on all of us to be open to that kind of discipleship. You know, I, I like what Philip did here. He took the time to teach the Ethiopian from the Bible. Uh, he turned back to that passage and he, he showed him uh, from the Bible who Jesus is. And, and I like that because the Bible is the super highway that takes us to Jesus. It's a narrow road sometimes. Sometimes it's a bumpy road. Sometimes it's a mountain climb. Sometimes it gets a little foggy. Uh, but it is the word of God that he's chosen to take us to Jesus. And the thing I like about the Bible is that every page points to Jesus. Every page. You can't, you can just close your eyes and flip the Bible open and it all points to Jesus. It's a super highway that takes us to Jesus. And so when we water the gospel seeds, uh, we find that we're pointing people to Jesus, and, uh, and he becomes the center of our joy and the center of our lives. Now, also what happens when we water the gospel seeds, we promote joy in the life of the person that we're discipling. Notice at the end of verse 39 that the Ethiopian went on his way rejoicing. Isn't that what your Bible says? He went on his way rejoicing. In other words, the result of good discipleship is joy in the heart of the disciple. And I've said many times that the joy of the Lord is that deeply rooted sense of satisfaction that comes when you know that you are where God wants you to be and doing what God wants you to do. 
We need to sow the gospel and water the seeds that have been sown. And when we sow and water, we promote joy in the lives of the people around us. That's the best favor that you can do for somebody is to point them to Jesus and to see Jesus grow in their lives. That promotes joy in their lives. Amen? Look at verses 36 to 38, and we see that the gospel root is confirmed. As Peter, excuse me, Philip and the Ethiopian are riding down the road, they come across some water. Uh, In fact, let's just take a second and read this text here, starting at verse 36. Now, as they went down the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What hinders me from being baptized? Then Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the Son of God. So he commanded the chariot to stand still, and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized them. As Philip and the, and the Ethiopian are riding down the road, they come across the water. Now, the text doesn't give us a whole lot of information about how much this discussion went into baptism. So we don't really know what teaching Philip had had given the Ethiopian about baptism. But we do know that when he saw water, he says, hey, you know, what's going to stop me from being baptized? I want to be baptized. And uh, and so he clearly had some understanding and desired to be baptized himself. Uh, They may have been on the subject right when the water came up. Uh, They might have been talking about that aspect of his Christian walk. But this new convert asked the question, what hinders me from being baptized right now? It's important to note that the only qualification that Philip gives for baptism is that you believe. You know, in our churches today, we come up with all of another list of qualifications for baptism. And uh, but but the Bible only gives one qualification for baptism that you believe. Uh, And so, you know, you don't the Bible doesn't say you have to go through 101. Amen. Bible doesn't say you got to go through this program or jump through that hoop or go, you know, join the church or or get this out of your life or that out of your life. The Bible gives one qualification for baptism that you believe. And you know what? One of the things that I've found as a pastor for all these years is that there has been a hesitancy in a lot of people when it comes to getting baptized because they come to Christ and they have all these issues in their life that come with them. And so they're still doing this and they're still doing that and they're living with the wrong person and all this is going on in their life and they got all these issues that they bring with them And so they feel as though I need to straighten some of this stuff out first and get to a spiritual level before I can get baptized. I don't feel good about being baptized while I'm still doing this and I'm still doing that. And every now and again, that word slips out of my mouth and and I still struggle with my temper and I'm still, uh, you know, you can go down your list as much as anybody else's list. And my advice is that, you know what? If you wait until you get perfect and get all that stuff straightened out, you'll never get baptized. Let's be clear about this. Baptism is the first step of obedience in the life of a believer. Did you get that? It's not the second or third. It's the first step of obedience in the life of a believer. It is simply a statement and a proclamation to everybody that says, I have accepted what Christ did for me on the cross. That I I identify with his death, burial, and resurrection. That I recognize that when he died, he died for me. And, and, And so in that identification, I want everybody to know, watch me from this day forward, I identify with Jesus and I'm going to follow him. 
And so we, we need to make that first step of obedience as soon as possible. Uh, God will help you with all the other steps involved in getting your life in line with Christ. And that process of sanctification is not a five-year program. It's not a 10-year program. It's not a 20-year program. It's not even a 40-year program. It's going to take you the rest of your life in that process of sanctification, and it won't be complete until he glorifies you and ushers you into, into his presence. Amen? And so, so Philip, his answer, you know, what hinders you from being baptized? Do you believe? And so we need to encourage people that that baptism is a way of proclaiming and confirming in a public way that we identify with the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. Baptism confirms that you believe and accept that Jesus took your place. It is important that we make that public proclamation and that public confirmation of our faith before others. The Bible tells us that if we are unwilling to confirm the gospel before men, that God will not confirm you before the Father. And so we need to make sure that we are willing to make that public confirmation. So the gospel needs to be sown. The gospel needs to be watered. But the gospel also needs to be confirmed. And then look at verses 39 and 40. See, I'm doing a good job working through this. Verse 39 says, Now when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus, and passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. The gospel branches were spread. Notice that when they came up out of the water, the Ethiopian is rejoicing, and Philip disappears. You know, just like, whew, he's gone. I don't know what the mechanism of that was, or if he, you know, turned around by the time he wiped the water off his face. Like, where did he go? But, uh, but, but, but Philip is going, is moves on, and he has another mission, and this Ethiopian also moves on with his own mission. Because the gospel is going to be spread into northern Africa, where church history tells us that it became an important location for the development of the early church. In fact, many of the manuscripts that we have that came to become the King James Version came out of the manuscripts uh, that came out of Alexandria and that northern Africa area. And so I believe that this Ethiopian had a unique opportunity to take the gospel to a whole new continent and, uh, and to see the gospel develop there. And while he was heading into North Africa, uh, the Apostle Paul was taking the gospel to Asia Minor and to Europe in his missionary journeys. The gospel was also spreading uh, in Syria and Libya and Egypt and down into the continent of, of Africa. And, and Philip uh, had him preaching, as the text says, to all the cities on the way to the coast of Caesarea and uh, uh, at the Mediterranean Sea. And so what we find here in the book of Acts is that the gospel seed was not only uh, sown in the hearts and lives of the Jews and this and now some Gentiles, but, but, and not only watered and discipleship going on, but that it was growing like wildfire. It was spreading all over Europe and Asia and Africa. And so the, what, we, what we find here in this whole book of Acts is the spreading of the gospel. The, the goal of our sowing and our watering and our seeing the gospel confirmed in the hearts of others is to see the gospel spread through them. We're to make disciples that love God and share his love with the world. Isn't that our mission? Isn't that what we're here to do? We're not here to come to church. I wish I could drill that into the heads of Christians. We're not here to gather on Sunday. 
We're here to make disciples. That means that we need to be sowing seed. We need to be watering seed. We need to seeing men and women confirming the gospel in their lives and seeing the gospel and the kingdom of God grow. That spreading then becomes the responsibility of each one of us as disciples. You know, when the weather gets warm, Carol puts out flowers all over our deck. She has these flower pots that she likes to hang. And she's out every morning, you know, watering these flowers. And, and John, I see John there in the back. He, he he's, you know, works on the, the flower bed in the front and weeding and, and watering and making sure that, uh, that all that gets taken care of. And, uh, and one of the things that, that you find is that, you know what, if you don't work at it, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, the, it becomes a mess. Are you with me? And the kingdom of God and the church of Jesus Christ, if we don't do what we're supposed to do, it's not going to grow. It's not going to happen. It's going to become a mess. And whose job is it? to take care of the garden, to sow and water. Whose job is it? Or you say, oh, the pastor, I will let him do that. No, it's all of us. We're the ones that have to get up and out and spread the seed and water the seeds and see it confirmed and bloom and to see the branches spread. Spread And so it becomes all of our responsibilities. And so my challenge simply for us today is let's be farmers for Jesus. Let's sow on the job and at home and among our friends and family. Let's not be ashamed of the seed in our sack. Let's make sure that we're spreading it in Lansdale and Montgomery County and to the uttermost parts of the world. And let's all commit ourselves to doing our part. Amen? I'm going to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes. And you know, there are some of us that have prayer lists of people that we've been praying for. And that's good that we pray for them. But have we shared the gospel? Have we communicated the good news of Jesus Christ to them? How faithful are we at obeying the prompting of the Holy Spirit? I wonder if you just allow the Lord to just convict you for a moment and then ask him to help you to be a farmer for Jesus. And as you think about those people in your life, those people that are around you that you need to share the gospel with, maybe the Spirit of God is bringing someone to your mind right now. I just want to pray along with you. Let's pray for courage. Let's pray for confidence. Let's pray for willingness to sow the seed. Just an upraised hand, say, Pastor Tony, just pray for me. Is there one like that? Amen. Yes, I see those hands. Yes, I see those hands. Think about your family. Think about those around you, your circle. And the Spirit of God is talking to you about your role in their lives. Last call. Any others? Just slip a hand up. Then, Michael, let's stand for that word of prayer. Let's pray together. And gracious Heavenly Father, again, we bow before you. Lord, we recognize that we've fallen short. We're not always sensitive to your leading, and even when we feel your prompting, we willingly disobey. Give us the courage. Give us the confidence. Help us to be obedient. Help us to be good farmers, 
in the kingdom of God. And may we have the pleasure of seeing seeds that grow and are blooming and spreading with seeds of their own. And we'll thank you for that. For each one that raised their hand, Lord, meet their need, answer their prayer. May they see the reality worked out in their lives. And we'll thank you in Jesus' name.